Hello. We are continuing our study of the concept of hope. As you can see, we've been having a summer of hope here at the Fishinger and Kenny Church of Christ as we've gone through our sermon series on this topic. And I've been encouraged by it because we have seen in so many different ways God striving to communicate to us that we can be assured of the next life, that we can have confidence looking to the future. We have a great hope. And all this, of course, is centered in on Jesus Christ. He is the center of it all. He is to be preeminent in our lives. He is Lord, and he deserves all glory and honor and praise at all times. And he is the one in whom we have our hope and our trust, our faith. He's the one who is, uh, again, the center of all that we believe in and the center of uh, the possibility for us to be saved. If it were not for his willingness to pay the price for our sins, we would be without hope. We would be uh, destined for eternal punishment as opposed to eternal glory and eternal home with God Almighty. This morning, Greg went over Psalm 33, 22. Uh, I'm going to read 20 through 22 as we begin tonight. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. And I encourage you to find this lesson if you weren't with us live or if you weren't uh, with us live on the internet or haven't listened to it yet, I encourage you to uh, look at this sermon. Uh, very encouraging. Greg goes through three examples, uh, Nehemiah, Solomon, and Daniel, and how all of them prayed to the Lord and praised him for the actual covenant, but then also for his steadfast or covenant love that he had for his people who walk in his ways, who obey his commands, who are living and making their hope real in their lives. An applied hope is how Greg put that this morning. Uh, incredible and wonderful and great examples for us to follow. He also showed how Jesus was the perfect, um, not just example, but actually lived, lived out God's covenant love for his people in his life and in his ministry. And of course, at the cross. Tonight, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter 3.15, a great passage that encourages all Christians to be ready to share that hope and to give a reason for it. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And what a great, not just encouragement for us, but a great command, a great exhortation for us to apply to our lives so that we can better reach out to people who need the Lord, who need hope in their lives as well. This is one of the ways that we can stand out in this world, especially during the pandemic and especially during a time of unrest, as we are calling it. People need hope. People need to look uh, to the future. They need to have a vision of victory, as Greg put it this morning. So we need to be ready. We need to be ready to share because right now, Christians are able to shine more brightly because the darkness is more dark. And so let's be prepared and ready to do that. So we're just going to go phrase by phrase through here this evening, starting with honor. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So here in this verse is where it begins. We need to have our hearts right. We need to understand what it means to honor someone. It's, it's respect. It is putting someone in the proper place. And you know, from a Christian standpoint, all human beings, all souls have great value. And we are called to view people from a different point of view as Christians. We don't look at them just from the fleshly point of view. We look at them from a spiritual standpoint. We want souls to make it to heaven. And everyone we come in contact with has a soul. Everyone is a person 
who will spend eternity either with God or without God. But here the honor is to Christ. And we need to give him proper respect, proper glory, proper, in his case, because he is God the Son, proper worship. And so this honor that he deserves is, is way higher. It's, it's the honor that only God deserves. And that's the honor we give to Christ. And it's important that it is Christ the Lord. The object of our honor has deep meaning. The same is true of our faith. People can trust in all sorts of things, and people can even have kind of an emotion of faith. But the Bible is concerned about the object of the faith, the object of the love, the object of the honor. And it's Christ the Lord. It's God Almighty. Here, honor Christ the Lord. And then, of course, the word holy is important here as well. And God, God's holiness obviously is different than our holiness, although because of Christ and his work on the cross and the redemption, the, the washing of our sins away, uh, there becomes a similarity. But God defines holiness. He is set apart by definition. And we recognize that Christ is holy. He is set apart. He is distinct. And God, again, has that in a way that's different than we humans. Now, we are made holy. We are set apart as well. But it's all because of Jesus. And it's all because of his blood. And then one more thing to notice from this phrase, in your hearts. And what Peter, in all likelihood, is meaning is that we need to be sincere in this. Obviously, it's in our hearts or in our minds, it's in our very being that we would honor Christ the Lord as holy. But he points it out because it needs to be real. Things with God aren't good if they're fake, uh, and they're not real, and they're, they're ingenuine. We honor Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts. We need to be sincere and transparent, and we need it to be as real as a human being can make it be real. We're going to be tainted in all our positive points. We're not going to quite love anyone as much as we should. We're not going to quite honor anyone as much as we should while we're in this fallen state. But that's our striving, and that's our goal, and we want this to be real. We want it to be sincere. And when we humble ourselves before the Lord, that's when these things take on their fullness. If there's any arrogance or pride or a feeling that we can accomplish things on our own, then we've kind of missed the boat on honoring Christ the Lord as holy. He is our Lord. He's our master. He's, our, uh, he's the one that's in charge of our lives. And that's how we need to live our lives. Secondly, so we look at the idea of honor here this evening. We also look at the idea of preparation as we read this verse. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you. And several interesting things here. Of course, to prepare for something is to work toward it. There is not a way to be prepared without some kind of work being done, some kind of task, some kind of energy being put forth to make whatever it is real in our lives. Preparation takes preparation, <laughs> and we are to be prepared. Notice, always. This should be part of how we live our lives. We should live our lives prepared. And there's a sense in which when we come to Christ, we become prepared. When we are put in the waters of baptism, we come up out of the waters of baptism, we've been given the Holy Spirit at that point, we've been added to the church, we've been forgiven of our sins, and we have all the blessings that go along with being in Christ. And so there's a sense in which right then we are prepared to share. We're prepared to make a defense because we have actually given our lives to Jesus Christ. And so we can at least share that much. But as we grow in Christ... We need to make sure we stay prepared and 
enhance that preparation. We need to grow. We need to be dealing with meat as opposed to milk. We need to be growing in our knowledge as we grow in the Lord, as we become older uh, Christians, as we have more time um, under our belts and as we have more uh, experience and knowledge under our belts. So we always need to be prepared, and that doesn't end at any certain age. We always need to be, as long as we are in this fallen world, as long as we're alive. And notice, not just always, but to anyone. So that adds a little twist to it, because different people need different things. And so this requires us to, as part of our preparation, pray to God for wisdom. Pray that we will be able to handle someone who comes from religious background X and someone different who comes from religious background Y and then someone who has none at all. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared always and to anyone. And it's a defense, which is an interesting word, but it's similar to the idea of confession. We think of confessing of sins, but confession, as we relearned again this morning, confession involves agreeing with God. Confession is what we do when we say Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We are confessing that. We are being a witness to that. We are testifying to that. And so we need to make a defense to anyone who asks. Now, we get to the uh, the brunt of that in the next phrase. What are we defending? What are we proclaiming? What are we testifying to? And it's the reason. The reason we have hope. And that's where we need to make sure we know why we have hope. That's what we're being told here in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. We're told to be prepared to talk about the reason we have faith. And ultimately, the reason is with a big, giant capital R, because the reason ultimately is Jesus Christ. He is the reason we have hope. He is the one we proclaim. It all is amazing how it all uh, fits together, of course. So, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. I mean, how awesome is that? We are responding to the questioner's inquiry. We are providing a reason for this hope because they've asked about it. Now, when are they going to ask? When our lights are shining. They're going to ask when they see that we handle a pandemic or a death, or some other struggle in life in a way that lifts people up as opposed to a way that drags people down. That we can still have joy in our lives. That the hope is real and evident in our lives. Notice it is a hope that is in us. In you, Peter says. And again, this in your hearts or in you is an emphasis on the fact that it's real and lived out. Very similar to what Greg said this morning about an applied hope. Well, if it's applied, it's real. It's evident. It's something that is made manifest in our lives. And that's how this hope should be. It, could, it should change everything about us. It should change the way in which we go to work every day. The way in which we go to school each day. The way that we interact with our spouses and our children and our parents and other people in our lives. It changes us. Christ changes us. So why do we have hope? What is the reason? It's the cross. It's Christ. It's the fact that God has kept his promises throughout the ages. God doesn't lie. It's all these things. We can have confidence. That's what hope is. It's assurance. It's confidence. Hope. We can have hope because God is trustworthy. Because God does what he says. And he loves us. 
And this was all made manifest. This was all made real when Jesus went to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I mean, there it is. So this doesn't have to be something that's overwhelming to us. 1 Peter 3.15 This is something that is crystal clear to any Christian. The reason is Christ. Someone asks you, why do you have hope? Why are you full of joy? Why are you full of love when life has beat you down so hard? Because of Christ. Because of him I have hope. Because of him I know I'm going to live in heaven for eternity. So how can I not be full of joy? Even in times of great sorrow. How can I not love? He loved me first. And on and on we go. But it's Christ. Ultimately, it is Jesus Christ. Now, our response, and this goes back to kind of the defense, this is kind of back to the uh, a courtroom kind of terminology. We need to do it appropriately. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So even if someone comes to us in a kind of confrontational way, like, why do you have hope? That's not very smart. If someone came in an antagonistic way, we still need to respond. We still need to be able to make that defense. We still need to be able to give that reason with gentleness and respect. In other words, we don't lose the light when we get into a confrontational discussion or an argument, however you want to define that. Our light still needs to shine. So, let's look at the whole text. Or what I mean by the whole text is just some of the surrounding verses. But let's look at 1 Peter 3, 13 to 22 as we close out this evening. And I love this because the context here, at least leading into it, is the possibility that we're going to suffer some. And the first question in verse 13 is, you know, hey, how, who is there to harm you when you're zealous for what's good? Uh, who can be against you when Christ is for you uh, in other places in Scripture? Uh, I think of 1 Corinthians 15. I think of the end of Romans 8. You know, who can separate us from the love of Christ? No one can. You know, who can, who can put up any kind of fight? No one, ultimately. But in this life, could there be trouble? And the answer is yes. And that's verse 14. And then we get into this. So let's look at 13 through 22. And then we'll close out this evening. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And then here's why it's okay and here's why Paul even said, you know what? I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And then he says, I even want to share in his sufferings. And to him, that would be honor. The next paragraph, 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Now those two verses, that's a whole different sermon or series of sermons. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers 
having been subjected to him. This Lord that we honor in our hearts as holy, he's alive. He was raised from the dead. And he is now at the right hand of God in heaven. And our assurance, our hope, means that we'll see him someday. Means that he will come back and take us home. And how glorious is that? Now, what's the reason for that hope? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ is the reason that we have an assurance for the future. Jesus Christ is the reason that we are full of joy in the midst of sorrow. Jesus Christ is the one the reason that we can love even when the world is hating. So stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and continue to focus on Christ and the hope that is in him. May the Lord bless you and keep you.